I'm sure to a decent portion of my audience, the words Club Penguin might ring a bell. Yes, the highly popular kids MMO from the mid to late 2000s has been shut down for over two years now, and even its successor Club Penguin Island has suffered from the same fate just a few months ago. Even so, I'm still finding out about all sorts of interesting facts about the game's development, even to this day. For example, some of the music in the game includes real recordings from a real answering machine. Now that alone might not be all that interesting, but the story of how those recordings got there has got to be one of the stranger rabbit holes I've ever come across while researching for this channel. Our story begins on an August day in 2001 Kelowna, Canada, with a purchase at the local Value Village thrift store. That purchase being a Sanyo TAS-1000 answering machine. The machine's previous owner, a Marta Lescart, had neglected to erase the tapes holding her messages, and upon hearing them, a teenage Matt Crisco had an idea. Over the next year, under the group named Taz1000, he and his friends Cassidy Pickin, John Rogers, and Scott Howard would create an album structured around the samples from this answering machine tape. That album would be called A Message for Marta. Hello? Oh, sorry, you've got a machine, not a real person. Leave a message and we'll call you back as soon as we can. Bye. The album itself is an interesting listen. The general structure of an individual track is to start with a second long soundbite from an answering machine message. The sample is looped until it doesn't sound like words anymore, and instrumentation is used around the new rhythm of the clip. As the song goes on, usually more context is added, until the meaning of the original message goes from a cryptic mystery to being a bit more clear. Probably the nearest comparison I can make is to the Neil Ciceriga mashup albums, although a message for Marta isn't edited nearly as quickly as those are. Marta also makes more use of original instrumentation than just sampling, which does give it a bit of a different sound. Surprisingly, the album has a pretty musically diverse track listing, ranging from the upbeat opener, I've Been Delayed, to slower and lighter tracks like Before You Leave. My personal favorite is Business Card Ad. In it, the recording's vocals mostly take a backseat to the actual band's performance, and they end up playing a pretty nice tune. The fact that my favorite track also has the least answering machine vocals present in it though highlights one of the weak points of this album. For each message on the machine, there's only so much audio to pull from, and hearing the same phrase over and over again can get to be a bit grating. With each track being made from an individual message, the album doesn't feel very cohesive, and the final track also is a bit underwhelming. While it is upbeat and ends on a high note, it doesn't really feel like an ending. Maybe if it had called back to other songs on the album, or had a bigger finish, it would have worked better, but as it stands, it feels like it could be replaced with any of the other tracks without much of a difference. That's not to say it's a terrible album. It has a few good moments, and for a band's first album, and also for the concept it tried to pull off, I'd say that A Message for Marta is a pretty good attempt. I am glad that I listened to it, it's just that... Well, these songs are definitely the kind of music that you would only listen to by yourself. Still, like I said, it's an interesting listen and it's currently up for free download on the Internet Archive, so the album is at least worth checking out. Stepping back into 2002 though, the band kicked off to reasonable success in their hometown, with their debut show at Miss T's Cabaret in Vancouver. Fans could earn the band's CDs in exchange for jars of live bees, which they would release at the end of their performances. I am not making this up. This is on the band's official webpage. Though that may not be of much credibility. After all, the news section of the site is essentially a Taz 1000 version of The Onion, with increasingly bizarre tales of the band members being murdered, fleeing the country, and a running joke about making fun of the members trying and failing to grow a beard. Yeah, it was a bit strange. Still, for a band like Taz 1000, strange seemed to be their thing. Members John Rogers and Scott Howard, though, weren't very big fans of this identity. Not long after the release of A Message for Marta, they would leave Taz 1000 to form the Canadian rock group Zeus. No, the other Canadian rock group Zeus. There isn't much information on Zeus, though, besides the fact that they would break up in 2005. That same year, what remained of Taz 1000 would also break up. While performing as a novelty act throughout Vancouver, they would often bring their namesake answering machine on stage. And for the band's final concert, they dropkicked it until it was completely destroyed. Each of the band members went their own ways after that final concert, though in terms of material online, there really isn't all that much more to be found, beyond the fact that John Rogers is now a music educator. 
and that's pretty much all there is for Taz 1000. A band made up of a few Canadian college students and a lucky thrift store find. They had their 15 minutes of fame in their hometown, but after nearly 15 years, most of their creative output has been lost to time. From extra tracks to a strangely undocumented documentary, all that really remains of their band is their one album, A Message for Marta. CDs of it are pretty rare nowadays, though the real Marta List card does claim to own a copy and enjoy it. And she's not alone. There exists a very small, but certainly dedicated, fanbase to Taz 1000 that's still active online today. Some of the members have even taken to forming their own group, Taz 2000, which attempts to recreate the idea behind a message for Marta. The band and their album are actually a pretty profound example of how, thanks to the internet, even the smallest, strangest things that people make can have communities that still care about them well over a decade after the fact. Okay, so I've been leaving out one pretty important detail about the band. Remember how they hit their peak in early 2000s British Columbia? Well, it turns out there was another particularly noteworthy project going on in early 2000s British Columbia. A flash game called Penguin Chat, which would eventually grow into the highly popular Club Penguin, headed by Lance Preeb, Lane Merrifeld, and Dave Crisco. And if that last name sounds familiar, that might be because he's the father to Taz 1000 member Matt Crisco. Around the same time that he was a member of Taz 1000, Crisco was also an employee to New Horizon Interactive, the company that created Club Penguin. And somehow, the Taz 1000 song I've Been Delayed made its way into the game as one of the original room background songs. According to Chris Hendricks, the main composer of Club Penguin's music, Taz 1000's contributions to the song didn't stop there though. And they, or possibly just Matt, though that's just speculation based on the timeline, also created tracks for some of the early Club Penguin parties. The message for Marta music, though, is definitely the most well-remembered. In fact, as both Club Penguin and its successor app, Club Penguin Island, both came to a close, the track could be heard playing in both of them. The song is no doubt silly, but it's also upbeat, and honestly, kinda charming in that regard. It's the perfect tune for a game like Club Penguin. And that's it. The surprisingly strange story of a Club Penguin background track written by a Canadian indie rock band based on the tapes of a previously owned answering machine found in a thrift store. Not necessarily something you see every day. I'll leave a link to the internet archive download of the album in the description, and if you want to hear more about Club Penguin music, I'd recommend you check out Chris Hendrick's YouTube channel. Over the past couple of months, he's been putting out videos talking about the creative process behind composing for Club Penguin, along with some more general history of the site. It's pretty interesting to hear about how Club Penguin worked behind the scenes. And if that seems like something you'd like to know more about, head over to his channel and show him some love. Mm -hmm.